أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على ملا نبي بعد أما بعد Welcome to our uh, part two of the series of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam which is of course a uh, broader uh, a longer series that we're doing about the lives of the prophets um, so we began with the Prophet Adam alayhi salam now we are now with the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam and uh, we had gone over in our last uh, uh, seminar or the last lecture uh, pretty much the majority of the Quranic verses, not every single one, but basically the most important ones that mention uh, the story of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Now we're going to go back and dissect in a different manner and try to discuss um, uh, what we can know and learn and also if we can uh, ascertain aspects of the life of Nuh alayhi salam and square it up with what we know of our own human history. So today will be uh, part two and we're gonna begin by talking about when did the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam live? And what do we know about uh, the chronology of him vis-a-vis -vis the other prophets? So when it comes to the time frame, obviously uh, we don't really have any archeological evidence uh, per se uh, of the existence of many of the uh, prophets of uh, our tradition. And so what, that it is what it is. Uh, neither should we uh, go to extremes and, and you know, uh, pretend that there are, nor should we be this be a point of concern to us. So what, if they haven't uncovered anything about the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, well, that's their archeological research and we believe in the Quran and the Quran has told us of the existence of Nuh alayhi salam. And by the way, for those Muslims out there who believe that the Ark has been discovered or found and they find pictures online and whatnot, please understand uh, there's not um, really, there's no actual uh, shred of historical evidence. What you find of pictures, this is, um, uh, what's a nice way to put this, somewhat of a historical scam, somewhat of a uh, internal you know, self-validation by believers who think that they're gonna find the Ark and whatnot. No, there is no uh, hidden Ark that has been discovered. We believe in the Ark because the Quran says so. We don't need to find some false archeological discovery. So please be a little bit more uh, verifying and don't just believe any picture you see online. So we don't really have any actual archaeological evidence of uh, the people of Nuh alayhi salam or of the uh, uh, mention of the Prophet Nuh or Noah in uh, ancient times. And so what? It is what it is. Uh, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam would have existed very, very, very early on. Now when I mentioned uh, the story of Adam alayhi salam, I mentioned a little bit about pr a probable timeline. And if you go back to that lecture, I mentioned that uh, it is a very interesting question, when did roughly the Prophet Adam live? And I, if you listen to that lecture, go back, we basically don't know for sure, and neither is it a point of our theology, so we shouldn't make any definitive claims. Uh, that having been said, if we were to posit Adam alayhi salam to be very early, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, 150,000 years, it doesn't matter to us as believers, it's all fine and good. And so, uh, because we have archeological remnants of human beings, we have uh, the bones of homo sapiens, our own you know, ancestors, our own exact you know, people and creatures in DNA, we have verifiable evidence. This is yaqini, this is qat'i, this is indubitable. It is beyond uh, a shadow of a doubt that human beings have lived on this earth for uh, many, many tens of thousands of years. In fact, uh, probably more than 150,000 years. So that being the case, well then, if we extrapolate Adam alayhi salam back to 100,000, 150,000, well then what remnants will remain? A lot of people don't understand this, that uh, we really don't have archeological uh, remains of histories beyond 5,000 years, right? Our recorded history of mankind only goes back, you know, 3,000 years, 2,000 years, 4,000 years, that's it. 
history has not been written down and recorded. We have remnants of uh, structure. We have, you know, um, the, the pillars that we find in some island, Easter Island or whatever, you know. We have remnants of pillars and structures that might date back in Turkey. They uncovered um, a, a monument that was built maybe 9,000 years ago. That's all we know, it's a monument. We just have a, a, a clearly human ordered structure. It's not something that is just coming uh, out of nowhere. People have built something, but who they were, what their names were, what their legacies were. They didn't record history, right? History has not been recorded, uh, written, mankind. Uh, the, the art of writing is relatively recent. So if Nuh alayhi salam and his name and his ark has not been recorded in ancient history, that is exactly what we would presume because ancient history has not been recorded at all. We don't have a shred of information about actual names of peoples and dynasties and whatnot, you know, before 5,000 years, much less 50,000 uh, years. So if we don't have anything from the archeological side, what do we know from our theological side? From our side, as I said, we thank Allah, unlike the Bible, we thank Allah, we don't have a timeline. We don't have a 5,000 or 6,000 year timeline. So if we extrapolate Nuh alayhi salam to be 10,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago, and somebody posits he might have existed during this time frame, so be it, it doesn't matter to us. But what we do know for certain is that Nuh alayhi salam was the first Rasul sent to mankind. So Nuh alayhi salam was the very first person who was sent to a nation that rejected him and that nation did not believe in him and did not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of Nuh were the first generation whom Allah destroyed. The Quran mentions multiple generations whom Allah destroyed, multiple civilizations whom the Quran tells we destroyed. We destroyed the people of Thamud, we destroyed the people of Ad, we destroyed so many of the prophets of old, right? Uh, so many people uh, were destroyed. You know, some of them we drowned, some of them uh, a storm came, some of them a loud noise came, some of them uh, a zelzala, an earthquake came. The first civilization to be destroyed by Allah was that of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Therefore, without a doubt, we believe as a part of our theology that Nuh alayhi salam existed very, very early on. After Adam, the first Rasul that was sent to mankind, Adam was not a Rasul, Adam was a Nabi. Adam was a Nabi because his children believed in him, right? And if you remember, we discussed the, dis the difference between Rasul and Nabi many, many, many uh, uh, lectures ago at the very beginning of our series. And uh, what we concluded was that a Nabi is uh, sent to a group that already believes in him is probably expecting him. They haven't rejected him. They shall not reject him. As for a Rasul, a Rasul is sent to a nation that does not believe in him. A Rasul is sent to a nation that does not believe in him. So he has to establish his credentials. He shall be rejected. Every Rasul was initially rejected by his people and sometimes they continue to reject him until Allah's punishment. And sometimes they eventually accepted like uh, the Quraysh and uh, the people of Arabia eventually accepted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So a Rasul is sent to a nation who does not believe in him. And generally speaking, a Rasul comes with a new Sharia, generally speaking, perhaps a new book, but that's not the condition. The condition is a Rasul is sent to a nation that he has to establish his credentials and prove himself. Nuh is the first Rasul. And the Quran mentions in so many verses that we don't have time to get into, frankly, there's so many verses, the majority of them about Nuh mention this, that when Allah wants to set a timeline, when Allah Azza wa Jal wants to mention from this to that, right? Always, inevitably, the Quran begins with Nuh. And this is enough of an indication that Nuh was the first Rasul and that his people were the first rejectors. The first people to reject the prophets of Allah were the people of Nuh alayhi salam. So uh, for example, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِ We sent Nuh to his people. And the Quran says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ وَجَعَلْنَا فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهِمَ النُّبُوَّةَ وَالْكِتَابِ We sent Nuh and Ibrahim. And we made in their progeny all of the prophets and all of the books were revealed. So Allah is very, very explicit that from the progeny of Nuh and Ibrahim, all future prophets came. Every Rasul and every Nabi that was to come 
came from the progeny of Nuh and uh, Ibrahim. So either from Nuh only, uh, and so for example, one can say that Lut السلام, is not a child of Ibrahim. Lut السلام, is a nephew of Ibrahim, and Lut is a direct descendant of Nuh. And the future prophets after Ibrahim were both descendants of Nuh and Ibrahim السلام. So Allah Azza wa Jal clearly mentions that every Nabi and Rasul that came after Nuh is from the progeny of Nuh, and after Ibrahim, is from the progeny of Ibrahim and Nuh. Another verse that shows that Nuh was the first Rasul is Allah says in the Quran, Inna awhayna ilayka kama awhayna ila Nuhin wa nabiyyina min ba'di wa awhayna ila Ibrahim wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa wa Ya'quba wa Al-Asbaati wa Isa wa Yuba wa Yunus wa Harun wa Sulaiman wa atayna Dawood Zabura wa rusulan qad qasasnahum alayka min qabl wa rusulan lam naqsusu alayk wa kallama Allah Musa taklima. In other words, Allah has a long list of prophets. And beginning that Prophet, beginning, Allah says, we inspired you, Ya Rasulullah, like we inspired Nuh and all of the Prophets after him. min ba'dihi. Hence, when does Allah begin inspiration? Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh is the first uh, Rasul and uh, uh, to be sent to mankind, and every Rasul after him is uh, someone who is a progeny, who is direct descendant of Nuh. And Allah is telling our Prophet Sallallahu that just like we inspired Nuh, we inspired Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq, Yaqub and Asbal and Isa and Yusuf and Musa and Harun, and we gave Sulaim uh, Dawood the Zabur, and we have mentioned some of the stories of the Prophets to you, and we have been silent about other stories and we gave the Zabur to Musa. So once again, where does Allah begin? Nuh alayhi salam. And Allah says in the Quran to the Quraysh, talking to the Quraysh, أَلَمْ يَأْتِهِمْ نَبَأُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ قَوْمِ نُوحِ Haven't they heard of the people before them, the Qawm of Nuh, وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ And those that came after them. أَهْلَكْنَاهُمْ We destroyed all of them. Notice, Allah is telling the Quraysh, haven't you seen the people before you? Beginning from Nuh, and all those after Allah destroyed. Once again, indicating what? The first destruction to the people of Nuh alayhi salam. And Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Before them, the people of Nuh rejected the prophets. And Allah says, وَقَوْمَ نُوحٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِ And before them all was the قوم of Nuh. So we go on and on. Point is, I'm kind of you know elaborating on this, uh, but it's very clear. Whenever the Quran has to put a beginning, we find Nuh is mentioned. And whenever the Quran has to mention the first nation who disbelieved, we find it is the Qawm of Nuh. From the Hadith, we get the same message. From the Hadith, we get the same message. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said regarding the Dajjal, that every single Rasul since the time of Nuh has told his people. Since the time of Nuh has warned his people against the Dajjal. But I'm gonna tell you something no Rasul before me before me uh, said. So once again, every Rasul since the time of Nuh, once again, when he has to begin, he begins with Nuh alayhi salam. And in the famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari, we learn that, uh, we learn that uh, the people will go to the Prophet on the Day of Judgment, they will go to many Prophets. They're gonna go to Adam, and they're gonna say, oh, Adam, you are our father, Allah created you, and make shafa'a for us. Adam will say, I am not you go to Nuh alayhi salam. So they will go to Nuh, and they will say to Nuh, O oh Nuh, you are the first Rasul whom Allah sent. You are the first Rasul whom Allah sent. So once again, we have the clear uh, uh, theological position. Again, this is very clear that Nuh was the first of all later prophets and Rusul. And this also, by the way, one can uh, rethink through. So. In our last lecture, uh, or two lectures ago, before I talked about Nuh, right? I went over uh, Idris and I went over Sheath. And I mentioned that Idris and Sheath, Ibn Kathir and others, they placed them between Adam and between uh, Nuh. Now, that is the position of uh, the vast majority of historians. And they take this straight out of the uh, biblical, the Old Testament. However, fact of the matter is, and I'm gonna be a bit bold here and say, there is no reason for us as Muslims to put Idris before Nuh. I put in my chronological series simply because that's what everybody else does, right? And that's what Ibn Kathir does as well. He literally mentions that, you know, that after the chapter of Adam and Sheath, he then mentions the chapter of, of Idris. However, if we were to say that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned multiple times that beginning with Nuh, every prophet after it comes from him, right? From their progeny, we made Nubuwa. Nubuwa, prophethood, came from the progeny of Nuh. Of course, Adam is an exception because he is the first human. So Adam is a separate case, nobody can be like him. He was the first human, he was created by Allah directly, Allah spoke to him directly. You can't compete with Adam السلام, he is our father, he has a special status, right? Allah created him up there, Allah spoke to him directly, Allah sent him down here. So. His prophethood was from up there. Allah spoke to him when Allah created him. Therefore, he comes down a prophet. But what appears to be the case, the first Nabi and Rasul on this earth was Nuh. And this is what the Quran and the Sunnah clearly seem to indicate. So with utmost respect to other scholars, and again, I know I'm going out on a limb. I know perhaps some others were, are going to, you know, find this problematic because again, the notion comes uh, that, you know, who are you to go against, you know, Ibn Kathir and whatnot. And um, uh, again, I'm not going against, I'm simply presenting to you. Ibn Kathir has an opinion, others have their opinion, but there's no Quranic reason to believe that Idris alayhi salam is preceding Nuh. On the contrary, the Quran, might actually indicate the opposite. So for example, in Surah Maryam, which I quoted, uh, I think two lectures ago, I quoted Surah Maryam, that Allah mentions Idris by name, and Allah mentions Idris after many, many, many prophets. And then the next verse or three verses after, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, after mentioning Idris and mentioning Ibrahim and mentioning Ismail and mentioning Ishaq and mentioning Maryam and mentioning Isa, after mentioning all of these prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, uh, alayhim. these prophets, listen to this carefully, these prophets are from those whom Allah has favored. Min Adam. They are all from the progeny of Adam. Wa mimman hamalna ma'a Nuhin. And they are from the progeny of those who are on the ship with Nuh. Wa min dhurriyati Ibrahim wa Israel. And they're from the progeny of Ibrahim and Israel. And we have favored them all. Idris seems to be from the progeny of Nuh and Ibrahim, which would make him maybe an Israelite prophet or maybe, Allahu A'lam, a prophet from one of the nations that are descendants of Ibrahim and are non-Israelite. Because, you know, there are other nations as well that uh, uh, were uh, Semitic in nature, not just the Jewish and not just the Arabs. There were other Semites as well. It is uh, of, uh, a misconception that some people have that there were only two types of Semites, the Arabs and the Jews. No, there were multiple types of Semites. Ibrahim alayhi salam had multiple, you know, um, uh, uh, civilizations spring forth from him. So it is very, possible that Idris alayhi salam is a prophet maybe from the Bani Israel but had he been from the Bani Israel we would think that we would find mention of him in the later uh, prophets the as I said the correlation of Idris to uh, Enoch right Enoch the correlation of Idris to Enoch it is biblical it's not Quranic right so some of our scholars correlated Idris to Enoch there's no Quranic evidence there's no Sunnah evidence to do so we can posit and the Quran, in my humble opinion, seems to suggest this. Now, but to be clear, I'm not stating categorically this is the case. Allah knows best. But I am stating that there is no reason for us to place Idris before Nuh. There's no reason for us. Idris can, uh, can be after Nuh. And in fact, I am stating perhaps the evidence seems to suggest that Idris is of the children of Nuh. I've mentioned a number of evidences here. And if that is the case, then that changes the entire game. And we can then say that perhaps Idris is one of the prophets that was sent to other Semitic tribes and nations besides the Jewish people. And besides obviously uh, the Bani Ismail, which is the Arabs and Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best. In any case, what we're getting back to our story of, of Nuh alayhi salam, what is crystal clear is that Nuh alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam predates any of the other prophets. And in fact, we would even posit, make a suggestion that Nuh was the first even Nabi that Allah inspired on earth. Because, إِنَّ أَوْحَيْنَ إِلَيْكَ كَمَا أَوْحَيْنَ إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ وَالنَّبِيِّنَ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَالنَّبِيِّنَ مِنْ بَعْدِ We inspired you, Ya Rasulullah, like we inspired Nuh 
and the Anbiya after him. Now, Nuh was a both Nabi and Rasul. So Allah says Nuh as if he is the first Nabi. Now pause here, how about Adam? We explain Adam is an exception and Adam remains an exception and Adam uh, came down from Jannah. Adam is created up there, Allah spoke to him up there. So Allah is saying to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, we chose you, we, we, we sent Jibreel to you like we sent to, like we sent to Nuh. Jibreel did not communicate with Adam first. Allah communicated with Adam directly. Imagine that, we went over the story of Adam, right? There was no Jibreel that communicated with Adam, firstly. Jibreel comes later in the picture. Allah directly communicated with Adam. That's a separate hukum. So when Allah is speaking to our Nabi, our Rasul, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you're not the first. There's many before you. Allah does not begin with Adam because Adam, as I said, has a special ruling that Allah spoke to him directly. As for Nuh, Jibreel was sent down. And so Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, you and Nuh and all the prophets uh, between you. Therefore, Nuh alayhi salam uh, is the first Nabi and the first Rasul on earth. Uh, and uh, uh, also this, um, the, from, from this then, we can derive another point. Another simple theological point, there should be no controversy over this. And that is that Nuh alayhi salam uh, was sent to an idolatrous nation, which means that sometime between Adam and Nuh, idolatry was introduced. This is common sense. You really cannot have it any other way. We firmly believe that the first man, the first of mankind were monotheists. The first of mankind believed in one God, worshiped one God. And they had morality, they had akhlaq, they had religion. They had uh, the uh, noble teachings of our Creator about the purpose of life, heaven and hell, Jannah and Naar, resurrection. And Nuh is coming, and Nuh is sent to an idolatrous nation. Therefore, common sense and the Quran, both, yani logic, they say, it. they will tell us that polytheism, pantheism, idolatry was introduced at some point in time between Adam and between Nuh alayhi salam. And the Quran is very clear on this point. Multiple verses. Right? Man used to be one ummah, meaning one religion, right? Ummah here means one religion, right? They believed in one faith, right? All of mankind was one ummah. Thumma, then they differed. Then Allah sent uh, prophets and uh, messengers, Mubashirin and Munthirin. In Surah Yunus, verse 19, Right? Allah says very clearly, Don't you know, indeed, all of mankind was Ummah Wahida. Then splits occurred between them. Then the divisions began. Therefore, Nuh alayhi salam is being sent because monotheism has been corrupted. The belief in one God has been supplanted by belief in many, many gods. Now, this belief seems to be absolutely logical and complete common sense. Do realize this is a point of faith and we are firm on it. Modern historians of religious studies, modern anthropologists of religion, you know, everybody who, you know, has theories of religion, whether it's, you know, uh, Emil Durkheim or whoever it might be, you know, your standard uh, famous sociologists and, and anthropologists of religion, uh, you know, they all have the exact opposite understanding. And they believe that monotheism is a later invention. It is a Mesopotamian invention, they say. It is an invention of the Bronze Age. They believe that primitive man, prehistoric man, uh, was by nature shamanistic or polytheistic or you know very superstitious or believing in a multiplicity of gods. And that monotheism is an aberration. Monotheism is a late uh, invention. Uh, the Jewish people were the most famous for it, but there are you know um, precursors to it in other uh, civilizations. And this is not the point to teach you anthropology of religion. You can take any class in any university and you will come over all of these theories no mainstream anthropologist believes what we believe, and so what? We have our theology and beliefs, and they have theirs. And you know, in the end of the day, um, we, we understand why they would say this, because they don't believe in our uh, textbooks. And when you look at the remnants of civilizations, when you unearth and, and, and dig up you know, uh, earlier peoples, you do find icons that are clearly religious. You do find you know, idols, you do find things like this. So in their unearthing of previous civilizations, their notion is that polytheism was the dominant. 
And also, one of the things they do, which is again, very superficial, but again, and again, some of them, I'm not, I'm, I'm, there are many who are exceptions, but some of them say, oh, look at, you know, primitive societies, societies that are cut off from civilization, whether they're in, you know, uh, or the Aborigines before they were discovered, or, you know, uh, people on, on, in certain islands, the Senegalese people that are still untouched, or various people in Africa that are living cut off from civilization. They say, look at their beliefs. All of them are shamanistic by and large. All of them have, you know, belief in uh, spirits wandering the earth and worshiping one's ancestors and whatnot. So they make qiyas, analogy. And they say primitive man would also be similar. And, you know, they have their reasons and whatnot. For us, we flip the script and we say, no, early man was monotheistic. Allah created man upon the fitrah. Kullu mawludin yuladu al fitrah. Every child is born upon the, uh, the uh, fitrah. And then uh, polytheism takes place. And so we firmly believe that idolatry was the exception to the rule. The norm is that people were upon tawheed. The norm was that kana nasu ummatan wahida. All people were one belief. And then this idolatry came. And therefore, the people of Nuh were the first nation amongst whom idolatry became completely prevalent. And from what it appears in the Quran, the reading, very clear reading we get from the Quran, is that nobody remained upon Tawheed except Nuh and his family, right? Uh, that Allah says in the Quran, uh, we destroyed everybody except Nuh and those who believed with him. And Nuh alayhi salam seems to have been the only person preaching Tawheed in an entire society of paganism. And this shows us that, because this does not happen overnight, this shows us that for a number of generations, there would have been two camps, polytheists and uh, monotheists. And then polytheism slowly took over and monotheism did not exist. And then Allah sent the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And how many generations therefore were there between Adam and Nuh? How many were the generations between Adam and Nuh? Well, it is famously reported uh, in our history books and in the traditions attributed to some of the companions, most predominantly Ibn Abbas, that there were 10 generations between Adam and Nuh. Now there's a weak hadith, the famous weak hadith that I have mentioned multiple times, uh, which is in Musna, which is in the Sahih Abi bin Hibban, uh, three, four, five pages of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, allegedly asking the Prophet some a whole bunch of questions. I went over this hadith so many times because most of these questions are mythological, right? Like who was the first this, who was the first that? And you can just sense that this hadith doesn't make sense. And one of the questions was how many generations between Adam and Nuh, right? And the Prophet allegedly said 10. I mentioned this hadith is deemed to be weak by almost all scholars of hadith and it is weak. It is actually very weak. So there is no evidence from the Prophet As for the Sahaba, there is a statement from Ibn Abbas which is reported in the Musadraq of Al-Hakim and in other books as well. Al-Tabari also mentions this, that between Adam and Nuh were 10 generations, all of them upon Tawheed. Between Adam and Nuh were 10 generations, all of them upon Tawheed. Now, this Athar, uh, as my, my methodology has been from the beginning of this series, uh, I have been very clear in this point that Anything we find of a historical nature from the tongues of great ulama and from the tongues of the Sahaba and Tabi'un, uh, we respect it, but it doesn't take the level of the Quran and Sunnah. And therefore, if Ibn Abbas indeed said this, Jayyid, good, but it doesn't become a point of faith. And frankly, uh, there is no reason for us to accept this, frankly, because it does not make sense that in 10 generations, Tawheed was wiped out and replaced with uh, shirk. It does not make sense that uh, 10 generations were upon Tawheed and then one generation came and it flipped and it became upon paganism. Uh, and actually this notion of 10 generations, we find it literally in the Old Testament. So like much of the, uh, if you look at the, the, the story of Nuh, uh, and Noah, and you look at the genealogy, you find exactly 10 people uh, between Adam and Nuh. In fact, the Bible even mentions around 150 years before the, between the death of 
uh, Adam and the birth of Nuh alayhi salam. And even Ibn Kathir, by the way, uh, himself dismisses this 150 years. And he posits that uh, maybe each one of these generations lived many hundreds or thousands of years. And therefore, in all likelihood, between Adam and Nuh were thousands of years. This is what Ibn Kathir says. Where does he get that these generations lived for many, many years? He gets this from inferring from the Quran that Nuh lived 950 years amongst his people. This is in the Quran. Nuh lived 950 years amongst his people. And so him, Ibn Kathir, and other scholars derive from this a point, And that is, if Nuh lived 950 years, then everybody in his generation also lived a long period of time. And those before him lived longer periods and those after him lived longer periods. Uh, just, and again, there's no problem in stating this. However, uh, throughout this series, I'm going to be very clear about what is a point of belief and what is an opinion. The claim that generations lived many, many centuries is not a belief of ours. It is a claim. All we are required to believe is Nuh lived 950 years and longer. As for the people of Nuh and the, grands and the grandchildren of Nuh and the grandfathers of Nuh, we are not told anything. And there's no reason for us to affirm or to deny. Allah knows best. If they lived many, many centuries, then one could extrapolate that, okay, maybe there were 10 generations and each one lived, you know, 500, 1,000 years. This gives you, yani, mashallah, you know, uh, uh, 5,000 or 50,000, however long you want to do. Allah knows best. In the end of the day, uh, it's not a part of our belief. And the less we say about ilm al ghaib, the safer it is for us. If there were 10 generations, it is possible. If there were more than this, it doesn't destroy our Iman. If there were less than this, there's nothing in our tradition to uh, you know, go against this. It's all unknown to us. And so whatever one holds, not a problem uh, whatsoever. We also learn uh, from uh, the Athar of the Sahaba, and again, Ibn Abbas is the, the primary um, person saying this, that idolatry began in the people of Nuh by venerating righteous people. And that uh, Allah mentions the names of the idols of Nuh, right? This is only mentioned once in the Quran. It is mentioned in Surah Nuh, in the end of Surah Nuh. Allah says, وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ And they said, don't leave your gods, which means they had a lot of gods. They had a multiplicity of gods. And then Allah mentions five of them by name. وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرًا Allah mentions five of them. Right? This means they had a lot of gods, and of them, five were the predominant, five were the uh, most uh, important. Now, Ibn Abbas mentions that these five were names of righteous people. And after they died, then people built images to honor them. And after a while, those images were then taken as icons, as gods besides Allah. And once again, it is a point of Ibn Abbas. We may accept it, um, and it's not a point of theology. If we don't uh, find it, uh, if there's, if for some reason we don't, we find an issue with it, one doesn't have to believe in the statements of the Sahaba when it comes to history, as we said multiple times. In fact, even their fiqh opinions, we don't have to follow. So how about a statement of a historical fact that they might be taking from somebody, they might be interpreting and whatnot. So in the end of the day, there's nothing wrong to believe this and it does make sense that how does idolatry begin how does uh, uh, the first idol come about it does make sense that there's a good intention uh, and this is found in some of our historical books it's not a Quran it's not hadith it's found in some of our historical books that uh, the first idols were actually constructed not to be idols but to be uh, reminders of the piety of the pious so when uh, pious people died uh, they constructed an image of that person to remind the people of how pious that person was. And then over time, uh, people forgot the purpose and they began directing their worship and their prayers to this icon. So again, it could be the case and there's nothing wrong with uh, you know narrating this and in the end, Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best. However, there is a slight issue uh, a slight, you know, problematic, problematic issue has been raised by a number of scholars, including Fakhreddin al-Razi and um, Ibn Ashur and other uh, scholars of our tradition. Those that are, you know, a little bit more, uh, let's say that, you know, they're, they're kind of thinking things through. And that is that, hold on a sec. How do we have Wad Suwa' Yaghuthi Nasr as names of the idols of, of Nuh 
And these are the names of the Arabian idols at the time of Islam as well. Because, you know, Wud uh, or Wud is a pre-Islamic uh, god, uh, an idol. Uh, he was the national god of the uh, Minions of South, uh, South Arabia. And there was a symbol of the snake associated with him. He's also called Wad-Dum and Wad-Dab and whatnot. And uh, in the Islamic uh, uh, history, we learn in the Seerah that Wad was worshipped, or Wud, because both names are pronounced Wud and Wud, was worshipped by the Banu Kalb, the Kalbites, the Kalb tribe. And his idol was located at Dawmat al-Jandal. And the Prophet ﷺ sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to destroy that idol. And as for Suwa, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, sent Amr ibn al-As to destroy uh, Suwa. And Yaguth and Ya'uq were also found in other uh, uh, places. Ibn Abbas said that the idols of the people of Nuh were then adopted by the Arabs. And so Wad was worshipped by the Banu Kilab, the Kalbites, Suwa by the Hudalis, Yaguth by Murad, Ya'uq by Hamadan, and Nasr by the Yemeni tribe of Himyar. Nasr was worshipped by Himyar. Now, pause here. Most of these uh, idols' names, uh, in fact, all of them, are found in carvings. We find them in archaeological sites that people used to worship them uh, pre-Islam. And so it is well known, these are the five names of gods pre-Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ came, out of many of the gods that are being worshipped, these five are also being worshipped. Now, this presents a slight problem. What is that problem? Uh, Fakhridin Razi mentions it, and Ibn Ashur and others, they mention this. What is that? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the flood, clearly the people of uh, Nuh were destroyed. And clearly their idols were destroyed. And clearly everybody post-flood is a monotheist. Everybody is a Muslim. And many, 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 many millennia go by, tens of thousands of years go by. And Nuh is the father, not just of the Arabs, but of every single civilization on earth, right? Every civilization goes back to Nuh alayhi salam and to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So when post Nuh, you only have Muslims, you clearly don't have the idols. You don't have the names of the idols. You don't have the icons of the idols. How then did the Arabs coincidentally start worshiping the exact same gods pre-Nuh? How could the names and the idols pre-Nuh be preserved after Nuh by many millennia, and not just that, but only amongst the Arabs. And this is something that uh, Fakhridin Razi himself problematizes. He goes, Fihi ishkal, right? There's an issue here. And how can we, how can these names remain? Clearly, he says, the idols would have been destroyed. Clearly, Nuh would not have kept the idols in the ship, right? Uh, and so how did these idols or the names even of the idols uh, remain all the way to the time of pre-Prophet uh, He brings up the problem and he leaves us cliff, yeah, on the cliffhanger. He doesn't give us any solution whatsoever. Ibn Ashur also brings up uh, this issue and problem. And he says that this is uh, clearly a, an ishkal here. There's a problem here. How do we understand the names that the Quran mentions attributed to Nuh are the names of the gods uh, in Arabia, right? Because these are the pre-Islamic gods of Arabia. And he says that, well, we can, we can say a number of things. Firstly, Ibn Ashur says, some people have said that when Allah mentions in Surah Nuh, the story of Nuh, and then he says in the middle of it, and they said, don't leave your gods, and don't leave Wad and Suwa and Yaghuth and Ya'uq and Nasr. Ibn Ashur says, this ayah is a reference to the Quraysh speaking and not to the people of Nuh. So go back to Surah Nuh, look at that page, and then understand what Ibn Ashur is saying. وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتِكُمْ And they said, who is they? Well, the context seems to indicate the people of Nuh said. Ibn Ashur is saying, yeah, the context might indicate that. But because these are the names of the gods of Quraysh or the gods of pre-Islam, we have to understand by the content and not the context that this verse is not coming from the tongues of the people of Nuh. Rather, Allah is talking about what the Quraysh say. He mentions, some of the scholars have done this to solve this ishkal. Then Ibn Ashur says, 
وَفِيهِ تَكَلُّفُ But this is kind of stretching it. It's a bit far-fetched because there's no indication whatsoever. The whole surah is about Nuh and the people of Nuh. And this one ayah, to cut it off and say, oh, it's for the Quraysh, it kind of sort of really does not make sense here. So Ibn Ashur says that that doesn't make any sense to me. So he kind of dismisses it, even though he says that's one solution that some have said. And so clearly, multiple Mufassirin are having the same question that I'm asking you here. How did the names of the Nuh's uh, idols remain and become adopted by uh, the pre-Islamic tribes? Uh, Ibn Ashur has another theory. Ibn Ashur has another theory. There's no evidence for this theory, but he needs to solve the problem because it is a conundrum. It is a, a interesting you know, issue. It's not a major issue, but it's just, you know, interesting. So Ibn Ashur says, in his opinion, this is his opinion. In his opinion, the idols would have been destroyed in the flood. Clearly, Nuh is not saving the idols. However, the descendants of Nuh are warning their children about the gods pre-Nuh, pre-flood, I should say. And so the names Wad, Suwa, Yaghuth, and Ya'uq, and Nasr remain amongst the children of Nuh as the names of the false idols and gods. And they're warned constantly about these idols and therefore the names trickle down. Then he says, Ibn Ashur says, when Amr ibn Luhay reintroduces idolatry into the Arabs, pause here, who is Amr ibn Luhay? There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim. Our Prophet said uh, that I saw Amr ibn Luhay being punished in the fire of hell. He was the first to introduce uh, idolatry to the Arabs. Amr ibn Ruhay lived a few centuries before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, so the uh, sharh or the, uh, you know, the, the stories go that Arabia was upon Tawheed and Amr ibn Ruhay went up to uh, Roman civilization and he brought back uh, the goddess Allat. He brought back uh, the goddess Allat and he, and he instituted Allat uh, in front of the uh, Kaaba. Uh, and so he is the one who reintroduced idolatry. So Ibn Ashur says, Amr ibn Luhay, when he introduced idolatry, he would have introduced the names of the pre nuh gods as well. The gods that go back to this time frame, the legends remained, and so he took those names and he reintroduced them. So I hope you understand his theory. The names are predating. The icons and idols are demolished, but the names remain in the descendants of Nuh. And then when Amr ibn Luhay reintroduces idolatry, he names those five names to the gods of the Arabs. And so the false gods of the Arabs also have those names as well. Now, it's a theory. Obviously, uh, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. Uh, this is a, an attempt to figure out what is going on. Allahu alam, I have another possibility, and then we'll leave it at this, inshallah. I have another possibility. Allahu alam. Uh, and again, it's not a major issue, it's a very trivial issue, but still it's interesting to, to think about these, these things. Uh, the, the, the possible solution that I have, and Allah knows best, is that we are not obliged to have the exact same name. Rather, what is being referenced is uh, a false god. And false gods, they transfer from civilization to civilization. The concept of the God, the God of light, the God of power, the God of this, the God of that, right? Uh, the name of the God changes, but the icon or the iconography or the theology of that entity remains. So if you look at, for example, any paganistic tradition, if you look at any paganism, you find within it a multiple of gods that are found in other paganisms as well. Right? Paganisms give rise to other paganisms. A simple example that we can all understand, the ancient, ancient Indians, the Proto-Indo, the Aryans, the Proto-Indo-Europeans, they had a god, god called Indra, Indra. And later on, the Greeks came and they renamed Indra Zeus. Zeus was their father god. Many of the legends of Indra, we find them in Zeus. Many of the powers of Indra and the follies of Indra, we find in Zeus. So the Greek Zeus is coming from the ancient, ancient god Indra. Later on, the Romans come along and the Romans get rid of Zeus and they name him Jupiter. 
and many of the legends of Zeus now become the legends of Jupiter with modifications with that. But the concept of Zeus or the Greek Zeus is the Roman uh, Jupiter, right? Now, imagine if somebody wanted to speak to the Romans about this God, right? And say, hey, your God existed in the pre-ancient times. And they said, oh, the ancient Indians, they also had uh, uh, Jupiter. They are technically correct even though the ancient Indians had Indra, not Jupiter. Because the concept and the fables and the follies and the legends and the, you know, all of these, 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 these stories about the mythology basically, right, remains. So, if a Roman person were to be told that, oh, the ancient Indians also worshipped Jupiter, he would not be incorrect even though the ancient Indians would never have heard the term Jupiter. And Jupiter has come from Zeus, and Zeus has come from Indra. You get my point here. So, when Allah is mentioning these names, this is a theory, I have it, and I don't know, it could be right, you could throw it out the window, no problem, but we're trying to reconcile uh, an issue uh, of how these names survived, when clearly civilization has been destroyed and the gods have been destroyed. And a response could be, as Ibn Ashur said, you could do a Fakhreddin al Razi and bring up the problem and don't answer it. And this is another theory out there, and Allah knows best. And that is that when Allah mentions the five names, yes, the five names are pre Islamic. Yes, they are Arab names. They don't, the names are not the names the people of Nuh used. But the concepts, the mythologies, those are exactly the same. Or we should say, not exactly, but you get the point here, the, the basis of them. And therefore, if Allah uses the names that were prevalent in pre-Islam, even if the people of Nuh did not use those names, but it's the same iconography, iconography, it's the same theology, it's the same mythology, well then, this is technically correct, just like if somebody were to be told in Rome that, hey, your God was worshipped in India, your, this idol was worshipped in India a thousand years ago, right? And Jupiter has been worshipped, you know, in many civilizations. He would be technically correct, even though the name Jupiter would not be known to anybody. Even the people of, of Greece would not have known Jupiter. They would have called him Zeus, right? Doesn't matter. The concept is there. So Allahu Alam, this is one way to, uh, you know, understand and then uh, not have any uh, um, uh, problems with this, inshaAllah ta'ala. In any case, if, other, if people have other uh, suggestions or ideas, do some research in history because here's the point, like I said, we have incontrovertible evidence that these five names are names of idols at the time of Islam. And the Prophet Nuh is millennia before Islam. So to have an overlap with the five names of the Arab gods and the actual gods of Nuh, it's a bit, you know, scratching of the head. And that's what many of our early scholars said, how can this be the case, right? Because the gods do not survive in iconography or not. So again, if you have another solution, let's hear it and let's see what other things we can do. Uh, the next point we'll do inshallah, but we're just gonna stop here. I'm just gonna tease you that this is our next topic and then I'll pause here because our time is up for today. The next topic we're going to do is the reality of the flood. Was it a global flood? Was all of mankind destroyed? As the Bible tells us, the whole earth was enveloped with flood, with water. Everything drowned. And the Bible tells us that all animals drowned as well. That's why all animals had to be protected by the ark. And the Quran references indirectly this. We said to carry two of every species, right? This is straight, the, you know, the, the notion of everything having been destroyed except those who are on the ark, right? And of course, the biblical story is that, you know, a male and female of every animal was put on the ark and uh, all the other animals were destroyed. And then obviously from that, all other animals came um, after that. So there was a new Genesis all over again. And so is this something we believe as Muslims? Was the flood global? Did the flood destroy all of mankind? Where do we to make of the fact that uh, we don't seem to find any flood that was global in all of human history. And again, we can verify this um, quite easily. If you look at you know uh, the science of, of archaeology, if you look at the realities of, of uncovering um, the past and whatnot, there are signs that are left of this nature. So what is one to make of this? I will quickly say that we as Muslims, alhamdulillah, do not have to believe in a global flood. And I'll mention the proofs of this in our next lecture. And as for the fact that 
all of mankind and all other uh, creatures were destroyed, that too is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, as we're going to discuss in our next lecture, inshallah ta'ala, we do not have to believe all other animals and species and creatures were destroyed. That is something that is from the Bible, the Quran, nor the Sunnah has this belief. And frankly, it contradicts everything we know about science as well. So since it is not in the Quran, since our reality that we know also does not add up to this, so it's not a problem for us. But I'll have to pause here because a very interesting point as well, just tantalizingly inshallah, one of the most interesting aspects of this notion of the flood or the global flood is that one finds this global flood myth, they call it, in pretty much every single civilization on earth, right? So the notion of there having been a flood that destroyed all of mankind, and from it afterwards mankind rebuilt, this has found pretty much universally in every single mainstream civilization on earth, even those civilizations that have been cut off completely from humanity for the last 40, 50, 60,000 years, we still find a flood myth amongst them. And so this has caused people to go one of two ways as we're gonna discuss next week, the way of skepticism and the way of faith and belief. And inshallah, of course, we are the people of faith and belief. So inshallah, we'll stop and pause here and we'll continue inshallah in our next lecture. And we'll talk a little bit about the global flood or was there a global flood, a global destruction or was there a global destruction and the global uh, flood myth. Until next time, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إليه